And it's good to see you today. Glad that you have come to worship with us here at Quaker Gap. And uh, wonderful to be together on this cool morning. And uh, we're grateful to the Lord for all that He has done for us. And we're going to take the time today to praise His name. If you are a guest with us for the first time at Quaker Gap, we welcome you today. Hope that you'll take the time to fill out this little tear-off section in our bulletin. Let us know that you are here. Just drop that in one of our offering boxes on the way out. Also, if you have a prayer request for us, write that on the bottom of that same slip. Drop that in one of our offering boxes on the way out. But uh, we are glad that you're here today. There are some announcements in the center portion of your bulletin. I'll just point some of those out to you today. Uh, First of all, make you aware that we do have our Tuesday morning men's breakfast Bible study at P.B. Clarkson King, 6 a.m. Tuesday for all men. Uh, Wednesday evening, we have our drive through and eat-in meal, and this uh, week we are having meatloaf, green beans, mashed potatoes, roll, and dessert, and uh, just tear off this little thing here on the bottom of this uh, orange sheet of paper and drop that in the offering box, or make sure you call before noon tomorrow to the church office, and we'll make sure we have enough food for everyone. Let us know uh, how many meals you need. And whether you're going to be eating with us or uh, taking it to go, however you want it this week. And that's followed by all of our Wednesday evening activities. I wanted to uh, also make an appeal for uh, Helpers for Gap Kids, which is our Wednesday evening children's program. And that takes place from uh, after our meal from about 7 until 8 o'clock. And uh, if there are any uh, who would be interested in helping out with that ministry, uh, we really need two teachers so that we can uh, continue a rotation, so you only have to do it like once a month. And um, if you are interested in doing that, please talk to uh, Meredith or talk to me about that, and we'd love to get you plugged in uh, to help out with that. All of the material and lesson will be provided for you. You don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is come prepared and uh, spend some time with our children for about an hour on a Wednesday night. So anybody interested in that, love to talk to you about that opportunity. This Thursday evening, our women are meeting for their uh, Women Warriors study at the home of Beth James. There's information about that on the back of the bulletin uh, if you need to know. Other than that, I think that's it. As far as those announcements are concerned, uh, there is uh, some information this morning we'd like to share with you concerning the Good News Club at this time. What is Good News Club? Good News Club is an exciting opportunity for elementary age kids to participate in an engaging and uplifting after school program. All kids are welcome to join in on the fun in a safe environment where they can meet new friends, play games, sing songs, and learn the good news about Jesus Christ. During each club, boys and girls will learn Bible verses, participate in interactive songs, and hear life-changing lessons from God's true word, the Bible. Throughout every activity, they will learn more and more about who God is. Good News Clubs are sponsored and organized by Child Evangelism Fellowship. We're a Bible-centered organization committed to helping boys and girls around the world know who God is and how they can have a relationship with Him. And by partnering with churches in your local area, we're able to host Good News Clubs in your community and nearby public schools. Good News Club, like any other after-school program, has equal access to the public schools, which was granted by the Supreme Court in the early 2000s. We ensure your child will be taught in a safe environment by volunteers and teachers who have been carefully screened and trained. Children will learn, grow, and develop healthy relationships with those around them and with God. Every child with a completed registration form is welcome to be in Good News Club. We hope your child can be a part of this safe program full of fun, friendship, and learning. We'll see you at Good News Club. Did you like this video? Then give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. I um, just want to let you know, several months ago, um, I remember Matt and Stacy Walton came and they shared their ministry, you know, of course, over there in Hawaii. And one of the things they had talked about was the Good News Club. And so myself and a couple of other people here at church, that really struck a chord with us. There is not a Good News Club here in Stokes County in our schools. So we have uh, spoken with a woman um, who kind of oversees that here in this general area. And so we're going to have just a really quick 
a brief meeting right after church in the fellowship hall for anyone who might be even just a little bit interested or curious about what the Good News Club is all about. We would be doing this. We First of all, we'd have to find a um, school here in Stokes County, K, K through fifth grade, so elementary age, talk to the administration, kind of get that up and running, and then, of course, um, go through our training as volunteers. Um, and they meet once a week right after school from about 2.30 till 4 o'clock, so it's about one and a half hours. And like I said, we're just trying to get a group of volunteers. That doesn't mean you have to commit to it every week, but we're excited to get this program up and running here in Stokes County. So again, if you're even just a little bit interested, please meet um, with me over in the Fellowship Hall after church. Thank you. All right, great opportunity. Uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, we are uh, getting ready for our shoe boxes. You can pick up a shoe box over this side of the sanctuary or a label. On this side of the sanctuary in the foyer at that side, you can make a donation if you'd like someone else to do the shopping for you. Our kids will be doing some shopping for uh, Operation Christmas Child. So just make those things available to you today as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you today for the opportunity to be together as church family, to praise your name. We pray that you'll be with our children as they go off to Children's Church. Continue to teach them, help them to grow. Father, that you would be present right here with us as well. Father, that your, your name would be lifted up, that we would hear your voice as we open your word. And Father, that you would be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to read from God's word. Stand with me from Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2 and 5 through 7. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing to Him a psalm of praise. Let's sing together, crown Him with many crowns.
Last week you heard us sing the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's yours with Matt Marr and Brian Fowler's song, and we've been learning that as a worship band, and now we're hoping to bring you in to the fold and sing it along with us called the Lord's Prayer. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin. Now we get to recite it. So uh, would you go to the center portion of your bulletin right here if you need to read it? It is in the King James Version this week, and many of you have that mesmerized. So uh, you will be able to say it from heart. Otherwise, if you need to cheat, look at that along with me. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Let's stand together as we read. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are today. We're grateful, Lord, that we can trust in you for every detail of our lives. Most importantly, Lord, we trust you for our future, 
for the hope that we have for all eternity, for forgiveness from our sins. We're grateful for our Savior Jesus who died on the cross in our place to take away our sins and then rose again from the dead to give us hope for all eternity. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for providing for us through Jesus the bread of life. And as we gather together today, Lord, we're grateful that uh, in each and every day, in each and every moment, in each struggle and hurdle that we must cross in this life, that you walk with us. And we're grateful to be able to bring our prayers to you as well. So we want to pray, Lord, for those families that are grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask, Lord, that you would walk beside them, give them encouragement, Lord, help them to to feel your touch. We want to pray, Lord, for those who are hurting today, if it be a physical need or uh, fighting a disease. Lord, we just ask for your hand upon them that you would bring strength. Day by day, Lord, that uh, you would continue to help them to look to you in all things. We want to pray, Father, for any who have any other needs today. Uh, Father, that you are aware of and maybe we are not. Lord, we just ask for your grace. We're grateful that we can trust in you, no matter what uh, our life brings to us. So Lord, on this day, we want to pray for our world situation as well. We pray for the nation of Israel under attack. We continue to pray for uh, the situation in Ukraine. And uh, Lord, uh, here at home, we pray, Father, that you would draw people's hearts closer and closer to you, that you would bring revival. And Father, that across this planet, people would know that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Oh, mercy, fall on me like a warm blanket on my turns me white on the inside I'm on my knees again cause I'm breaking your heart and put in me what I cannot buy with gold oh put in me God, come restore my broken soul. Put in me what I cannot give myself. Put in me a clean heart. I know all my broken places like the back of my hand. I slapped your face again. And wash me in your love and hold me tight like a baby. Till I have no memory of ever breaking your heart, your heart. And put in me what I cannot buy with gold. Put in me, oh God, come restore my broken soul. Put in me. What I cannot give myself Put in me And put in me What I cannot buy with gold Oh, put in me, oh God Come restore my broken soul Oh, put in me What I cannot give myself Put in me 
a clean heart. Let's say that uh, you owed over a million dollars and you couldn't make the payments on that loan. And let's say that you went into the creditor's office to plead with them to arrange some sort of payment plan that, that would suit you, and they, but they threatened to take your home and your car and everything that you own. And let's say that you, you say... Can I speak with the chief financial officer for a few moments? And, and then when the CFO comes out, you just you beg with him to please be merciful to you. And let's say the CFO told you, well, I'll see what I can do. He goes back into his office and returns to tell you that they've decided to cancel your loan completely. A million dollar debt, gone paid in full. And they tear up the note. They tell you that you're free to go. What's the first thing you would do if you were, you owed over a million dollars and your debtor canceled the debt? You know, after checking your account online to make sure that this is real, to make sure that it's true, what would be the next thing that you would do? Well, hopefully you wouldn't start racking up another debt right away by celebrating or something like that. Or, or hopefully you would write a letter thanking the creditor for the generous reversal of that debt, however they managed to swing that. But there's something that I bet would never cross your mind. If a debt of over a million dollars that you owed was canceled, I bet you would not knock on your neighbor's door who owes you $100 and put your hands on his neck and threaten him if he refuses to pay you back right now. Imagine being forgiven over a million dollars, that's 10,000 C notes, and moments later shaking down your neighbor for one $100 bill. That's exactly the scenario in the story that Jesus told a servant was forgiven a huge debt and then turned around and nearly beat a fellow servant over a much smaller amount. Had him thrown into debtor's prison over, over one day wages when he'd just been forgiven over 20 years of wages. Let's just say this didn't end well for the unforgiving servant. The servant who had been forgiven much found himself back in debt and facing punishment. Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The correlation between God's forgiveness and our forgiveness is emphasized in this parable and in the Lord's prayer. It's just evil to receive forgiveness from God while withholding forgiveness from anyone. Our sermon series is Prayer Lessons. We've been digesting the Lord's Prayer one bite at a time. We saw the postmark, Our Father who art in heaven. We saw the praise, Hallowed be thy name. We saw the politics, Thy kingdom come. We saw the purpose, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We saw the provider, give us this day our daily bread. In fact, we followed that up with a covered dish meal just to prove it. And then this morning, we look at the pardon. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, this part of the prayer begins with an assumption. And the assumption is simply, we all have debts. Jesus says, we all must pray, forgive us our debts, which assumes the fact that we are all debtors. 
And the holder of that note is none other than the Lord himself. Who, who is it we're praying to again? Remember back to the postmark. Our Father in heaven. We're praying to our Father in heaven and we're saying, forgive us our debts. So somehow we owe something to God. And it's true of each and every one of us. So Jesus leads us to ask our Heavenly Father to forgive us our debts. Now what is that debt? Well, we begin by identifying the debt we owe, the debt we owe. Now, before you start pulling out your pocket calculator to try and computate what you owe God financially, you know, you could start from the day you were born until now to see all of the things that God has given you and try to add it all up. We need to look at a parallel passage. Luke uses a different word than debt in his abbreviated version of the Lord's Prayer. So Luke has a version of the Lord's Prayer too, but it's, it's much shorter, and he uses a different word than debt. He says, forgive, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Forgive us our sins. So Matthew uses the word debt. Luke uses the word sin. Which word did Jesus use? Well, Jesus spoke Aramaic, so chances are it was neither of these words that are found in those versions of the Bible, but a word that could be translated either way. And the debt that Matthew speaks of, that we owe to the Heavenly Father, must be a moral debt, not a monetary debt. If you combine these words, debt and sin, we would say, well, this type of debt is not something we owe financially. It's something that we owe to our God morally. And although you might say that we definitely do owe God everything as our creator and our sustainer and our provider, we have nothing without him. We are nothing without him. The specific thing here that we owe to our God is our obedience. We owe him our life our will, our purpose, our obedience. If God is your heavenly father, and if God is a holy and loving God, and if we are each one of us his loyal subjects as part of his kingdom, and if it is your desire to see his will done in your life as it is done in heaven, and if you are dependent on him for all of your basic needs, all of your daily bread, then you owe him your obedience. So how do we end up in debt to God? How did you end up in debt to God? Well, the word that Luke uses for sin literally means to miss the mark. So forgive us, God, when we miss the mark. So a sin is kind of like a missed free throw, okay? I want you to imagine that you're standing at the free throw line. Uh, you know, you dribble the ball a couple times. You bend your arm, you bend your knees, and you let it fly, right? Except to miss the mark means it's an air ball. I mean, this is the worst free throw that's ever been taken. It touches nothing. Not the backboard, not the rim, not the net, nothing. It is a complete air ball. And in the stands, they are yelling, air ball, air ball. That's what it means to miss the mark. That God has a standard of holiness that he would like for each of us to be able to meet. And not a one of us can. And not a one of us has ever come close. Sin in the Bible is described as breaking God's law. It's also described as wandering off of God's path. Sin is described as rebellion against God, as falling short of God's righteous standard. We recognize that we have not behaved as God's obedient children. We have not hallowed his name. We have not represented his kingdom on earth. We have not done his will, but we've done our own will. We have not shared the, the excess bread that God has given to us with others as we should. We are in debt to God as sinners against him. <clears throat> but what about the word trespass? Since some of you like that word, when you say the Lord's Prayer, you just kind of go right into the trespass. Why is it that some people say trespass, some people say debts? Well, trespass is a word for sin. And um, it means to step over the line. 
to trespass. It means you are somewhere that you do not belong. Right? If you are a trespasser, you have to worry about big dogs and landowners with rifles. That's what you worry about when you're a trespasser. Well, William Tyndale was the first man to ever translate the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into English, and he translated the Lord's Prayer like this. O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Thy will be fulfilled as well in earth as yet in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive our trespassers. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so that was the first time that the Lord's Prayer was translated from Greek to English by William Tyndale. And that became the version that people learned. And the Anglican church early on included Tyndale's version of the Lord's Prayer in their book of common prayer, which was a book from which they worshipped and recited as churches. And if you attended a church that used the book of common prayer, um, you learn trespasses. If you grew up in a mainline denominational church, chances are that you learned how to recite the Lord's Prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, which uses William Tyndale's version, just cleaned up into a little bit more uh, modern-day English. You learn trespasses. Later English translators, beginning with the King James Version and on, translated the word debt. So what matters is that we understand that we all need forgiveness. Why? Because we have all sinned against God, we have all trespassed against God, and we are all indebted to God. It all means the same thing. Jesus taught us to pray this prayer, not because he needed to pray it. Jesus did not need to pray this prayer. He was morally perfect, but because he knows that we are all sinners. His disciples, his followers are all sinners, and we desperately need the forgiveness of God. We are in debt to God. We are morally bankrupt. And a lifetime of obedience would never be enough to pay off everything that we owe him. So the best we can do is to get on our knees and beg for forgiveness to our God. Now, in our cultural climate, these thoughts are not very popular. People these days don't believe that they need forgiveness from anyone. Our culture doesn't encourage forgiveness. In fact, the word these days is tolerance. Tolerance. You do you. I'll do me, and we'll just learn to tolerate each other. No right, no wrong. It's all just a bunch of gray areas. We just need to learn how to get along, that's all. But what if there's a God who created you and loves you? What if there is a God who is deeply offended when you break his law? What if just, just walk with me here. What if God is grieved by your sin and it hurts him? What if your sin must be punished and God cannot allow sin to enter his presence? What hope is there for you before God if all of that is true? God doesn't tolerate sin. He punishes sin. So Jesus teaches his followers to approach God for forgiveness. Because God is the one that we owe. So fortunately, although you owe God more than you can ever repay, God loves you more than you will ever know. And, and, and as a result of that, when we approach God for forgiveness, he is willing to forgive. He looks forward to us coming to him to ask for forgiveness, and he is ready and willing and merciful to forgive us. And what we learn about God is that he is more than willing. He does everything that he can possibly do to forgive us. The best part of this prayer, or the first part of this prayer, is the debt we owe. Well, the second part is the love that God shows. And you can call it the best part, too. If the image of God that you have in your mind is an angry God, a God who wants to see you beg and squirm, a God who enjoys punishing you, then your image of God is all wrong. That's not who God is. 
Sure, God hates sin. Sure, God is grieved by sin. But God loves you deeply and wants you to come to him for forgiveness. So the story of the prodigal son pictures God as a grown man, a distinguished father, running down the road shamelessly to greet his disgraced son, embracing him, kissing the neck of the one who broke his heart and dishonored his name. And scripture affirms that this is the heart of God. Peter writes, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The psalmist writes, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The prophet Micah writes, Who is a God God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. So why does Jesus encourage us to pray to our Heavenly Father for forgiveness? It's because our Heavenly Father is a merciful, forgiving, loving God. And there is no more beautiful expression of the love of God for us than what Jesus did for us on the cross. You want to see the love of God in action? Look at Jesus on the cross. You see, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts, because he knew God's plan. Jesus was the one who would go to the cross to pay the price for our sin, completely to cancel our debt, to take away our sin. So in this prayer, we see the debt we owe, the love God shows, and the price Christ paid. Remember, Jesus on the cross, as he hung there, humiliated, dying, suffering, an innocent man, dying the death of a criminal. And he looked upon the men who hung him there, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the last words that Jesus spoke are recorded in the Gospel of John. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. It's tetelestai. It was a statement that was used commonly at the bottom of a canceled debt. It means paid in full. It means that the suffering and the death is finished, surely, but it also means that the price for sin is paid in full. And so when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation from your sin, you are completely forgiven by God on the basis of his blood, on the basis of the price that he paid for you on the cross. Here's how Paul said it. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, paid in full. So if you haven't noticed by now, Jesus is the answer to so much of this prayer all along the way. I hope you've seen it. Jesus teaches us to pray to the Father, thy kingdom come. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the answer to that prayer. Jesus teaches us to pray to the Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is heaven coming to earth to do God's will. He's the answer to that prayer. Jesus teaches us to pray to the Father, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the answer to this prayer. Now Jesus teaches us to pray to the Father, forgive us our debts. And Jesus is our forgiveness. He is the one who pays the price to take away our debt. He's the answer to this prayer. The miracle of the cross is that through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are justified before God. You are forgiven of all your sins, all of your trespasses. Your debt is completely canceled for all eternity. There's an old song that goes like this. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt 
that I could never pay. I love those first lines. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Boy, when those two things come together by faith in him, we receive forgiveness and payment for our sins in full. So we've seen the debt we owe, the love God shows, the price Christ paid. But the hardest part of this section of the Lord's Prayer is this next verse. We all want forgiveness from God. We all want forgiveness from him. But we all do not want to extend forgiveness to those who have sinned against us. That's where this gets real and personal and difficult. Right? We've gotten on our knees and begged for forgiveness before God, and he's forgiven us of all of our sins. Our debt has been completely canceled. Now, how are we going to treat one another? How are we going to treat the people who have hurt us? How are we going to pe- treat the people who have done, done us harm in our lives? How are we going to treat the person who abused us? How do we treat the, the person who has walked out on us? How do we treat those people who have been unfaithful and just downright mean? How do we treat them? We all want our debt forgiven, but like the servant in Jesus' parable, we don't want to forgive all of those who owe us. We kind of like to hang on to a little bit of that debt, don't we? No, you owe me. You owe me big time for what you have done. And I'm not releasing that debt. There's no way I will ever forgive you. While at the same time receiving the ultimate forgiveness of our sins from our God. You know, we aren't given a choice. Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. There's an as in there, right? As we forgive our debtors, you forgive our debts. There's a connection between these two things. No, it's not that it's not that. God forgives us when we forgive, but it is this. God has forgiven us, so we should forgive. That's the way it works. There is a connection between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others. And this isn't the only place in the Bible where we see it. Because in the book of Matthew, after this prayer, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Wouldn't it be horrible to find out that your sins were not forgiven because you were unwilling to forgive sins? A believer in Jesus Christ is known by forgiveness. Mark 11, 25 says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. There's power in forgiveness when we forgive. It releases the forgiveness of God. This prayer is about more, however, than just receiving forgiveness. It's about giving forgiveness. The debt we owe, the love God shows, the price Christ paid, and the grace that we grant. The grace we grant. What would you have to say about someone like the servant in Jesus' parable who is forgiven a million dollars yet demands a hundred What do you have to say about someone like that? They're selfish. They're petty. They're ungrateful. Well, the same can be said of a Christian who holds a grudge and won't let go. A Christian who refuses to forgive. Do you know what an unforgiving Christian is? An oxymoron. You might say they're not even a Christian. An unforgiving Christian. The very definition of a Christian is one who is like Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, you should be endeavoring to be more and more like Jesus Christ. How can you be anything like Jesus Christ if you refuse to forgive? The one who has forgiven all of our sins expects us to forgive. Unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. In fact, maybe it's just a moron. N.T. Wright says, failure to forgive one another isn't a matter of failing to live up to a new bit of moral teaching. It is cutting off the branch you are sitting on. Isn't that beautiful? You're not going to forgive others. You're just cutting off the branch of forgiveness with which God has forgiven you. 
Christian, you are forgiven, so you must forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. And if you refuse to forgive, you don't look anything like your Lord. Now make no mistake, when someone hurts you, they should be rebuked. When someone commits a crime, they need to be reported. It needs to be prosecuted. There needs to be justice under the law. We should always seek justice. However, however, none of that eliminates the need to forgive. And don't wait for someone to ask for forgiveness. I've heard that before. (laughs) Well, they haven't asked me for forgiveness, so they won't receive any forgiveness. Jesus didn't wait for you to ask for forgiveness before he died on the cross in your place. He paid your debt in full before you were even born. (laughs) And now we have the opportunity by faith to receive that forgiveness freely from him. So we should treat others in the same way. Forgiveness is not something that has to be pulled out of us. Forgiveness is something that we should offer freely. And there's no greater demonstration of God's grace and kingdom here on this earth than when someone who has been wronged forgives. It's beautiful, forgiveness. There have been many illustrations of this throughout the history of mankind. There have been people who were tortured in in Nazi concentration camps who had an opportunity later in their life to forgive the perpetrator of those crimes. We look like Jesus when we forgive. So if we are to pray this prayer effectively, we must, first of all, daily humble ourselves and confess our sin, claiming God's forgiveness in Christ. It it means daily getting on your knees and confessing your sin before God. And and claiming that God has forgiven me and receiving that forgiveness each and every day, it requires us to confess our sins. And that confession keeps us humble and it motivates us to to obey our God. And and in addition to that, claiming our forgiveness in Christ, we must remove all bitterness and malice and anger against those who have wronged us. As I said, that's the hard part. There is no greater freedom than to drop your grudges and let your burdens go. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Let him handle it. He can take control of that. There will be justice in the end. He always does what's right. So let him have it. Receive his grace and forgiveness as a gift. You are free. The debt has been paid in full. Your debt is covered. But then give his grace and forgiveness to others and let your burdens and your bitterness go forever. Be free of them. Receive it and give it. You know, perhaps there's someone that you need to go to. Perhaps there's someone you need to spend some time with to talk to. Perhaps you can't even face them. You just need to write them a letter. I want to encourage you to forgive. Because truly, the power resides within you to forgive. They don't have to change anything. They don't have to do anything. The power resides within you to say, I was hurt. I know that... You don't think you did anything wrong? I know that maybe you feel justified in your own eyes and you don't think you need to be forgiven, but I need to say this. My God has forgiven me and I have forgiven you. There's no more beautiful and Christ-like thing to do than to grant forgiveness to those who are undeserving. And that's what Jesus did for us. And that's what we do for one another. And it's a part of the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you this morning for the fact that we have a Savior who has forgiven our sins. 
that our debt and our trespasses have been released. Father, we have eternal life and hope in you because we have been justified in your sight. Lord, that our sins have been punished completely on the cross in the person of Jesus so that we don't have to pay for them anymore. I thank you that this is all true because of faith in you. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that has not put their faith in you as their Lord and Savior from sin, that today, Lord, they might make that decision to receive the free gift of forgiveness that comes from the cross today. But Lord, I also want to pray for us as followers of you that we would learn from the beautiful example of Jesus what it means to forgive. And Lord, if we've been holding back I pray that you would give us the grace and the mercy and the love to be able to look like you and grant forgiveness to those who don't even deserve it. We praise you and thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I was Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the sweet forgiveness that we have from you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that as we go out into this world to represent you, that we would be people of grace, of mercy, of forgiveness, unlike those of this world, Lord, that we would represent you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.